Hi everyone. Welcome to the Road Ahead webinar. We're gonna wait for people to be added. We're at a hundred people already. And then yes. we'll get started in a few seconds. While people are joining, if you would like to, um, in the chat, put your name and where you are in the world, that would be great. We'd love to see where you are. See who's here. Hello from Scotland, Italy. This is lovely. Nice to see you all. Yeah. Egypt. Hello, France, Vienna. Just another minute and we'll get started as people are still joining. Just another minute or two, just another minute and then we'll get started. People are still, still coming in, which is, which is great. And if you're just joining, if you'd like to put your name and where you are in the world so you can see who's here, that would be great. See some of our ambassadors are here. Thank you. All right, so um, as people are saying hello uh, in our chat, I'd like to introduce myself. I am uh, Rosa Maurice Clark, Communications and Events Manager here at Crossref. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar, The Road Ahead, uh, which is our mid-year update. Uh, we usually have these updates in November, um, but uh, there's so much going on that we wanted to start having mid-year meetings or catch-ups with you all. So that's what this is today. Um, uh, we're going to be doing this twice. So today is for our community members that are nearby in the America's time zones. And uh, tomorrow we will run this again for our community members near the Asia Pacific time zones. Alrighty then, so let's get started. Um, a couple of things to mention. The chat is nice for introductions, which is great, as you all can see. Um, but for questions, please use the Q&A um, button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, that will help us keep track of the questions. Um, we have Isaac and Shane on hand who will be answering questions throughout the presentations. And uh, today's session will be recorded and we will share um, the recording in a few days along with the slide deck. Uh, the agenda today will cover technical debt, strategic planning, and then we'll update you um, on our six goals. So I will let you know um, when we, where we are on the agenda as we transition. And I will be trying to keep our speakers to time as we have a lot to cover today. So uh, most of us will have our videos off um, after we introduce ourselves, but if any Crossref people who are speaking today are on and are willing to just turn your videos on real quickly and just wave hello, that would be great. And uh, this will be our speakers for today. <laughs> Thanks all. Great, so um, let's get started. Uh, Jeannie, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Rosa. Um, yeah, we have a lot of people excited to speak and update everyone today. Um, we're going to talk uh, using the framing of each of six strategic goals, which you can see there. Um, if you go to our website, crossref.org slash strategy, you can read the full narrative about each of those six. And it extends our 2018 strategy by adding two new goals. One is our commitment to live up to POSI, 
the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And the second additional goal is to bolster our team. So that page went live last week and it gives full information about what we're aiming for in 2025. Um, and today we're picking out just a few of the projects under each goal and talking about recent or near and imminent progress. Uh, but before we do that, um, over the last year or so, we've been focused on how to scale our 20 year old system and operation and adapting to new ways of working. So far, we've made really good progress, reducing operational and technical debt, removing roadblocks, roadblocks to try to get more done. Um, so before we go through all of those six goals, we're going to talk a little bit about tackling that tech debt. Um, and I'll ask Joe Wass, who heads up software development, to take it from here. Cool. Thank you, Jeannie. Can you hear me OK? Yep. Cool. So I'd like to talk a bit about the software systems that power Crossref, old and new, how and why they were originally built, and also how we're maintaining them. You'll hear later in the call about the new features we're planning to build, so I'm going to talk about how we approach that as well. So first, we need to talk about technical debt. So technical debt is a natural and often useful part of software development. When an organisation is building software, often there is a sensible path to getting the job done. Because we don't have a crystal ball to see into the future, these choices mean that we have to make some assumptions. And while these assumptions help us get the job done, they can make code inflexible and uh, they can make it harder to work with over time. So it's important to revisit them and to spend time making improvements or just like monetary debt, the interest can start to build up. And when that happens, it becomes increasingly difficult to work with the code and deliver those much needed changes. But identifying technical debt to a services isn't always simple. While the symptoms are often technical, the underlying causes are often much broader. We have to ask, what was this code meant to do at the time it was built? And are we still trying to do that thing? These are questions not just for developers, um, but also for the whole organization, because what might have been perfect a solution for Crossref in 2001 wasn't right in 2011. And what was right in 2011 might not be right in 2021. Over the past two decades, we have adapted our content system code base to try and keep pace with our changing role in our community. But at this point in time now, we're in a position to really start making some much more substantial changes. In the past year, we've grown our software development team and started the process of building a new generation of systems for Crossref. Next slide. So our legacy content system has been with Crossref kind of right from the start. It now handles things like content registration, XML querying, reporting, access control, membership, funder registry, and a lot of other things. And it was designed to be run on our servers in the data center. Although we have made improvements to scale it up over the years, there are some fundamental things about its design that make it quite difficult to move it just to the cloud um, or automatically scale to meet fluctuating demand or adapt to the ever-changing scholarly community. So our new strategy is to prefer building new functionality in cloud native technologies rather than try to extend the content system code base as is. So we're at the point where the underlying software design of content system needs revisiting. The code in content system was originally built for a smaller, simpler community. And we now have thousands of members who publish much more content and they are much more diverse and they have much more diverse structures and publish a much more diverse set of content types. So we have some really exciting plans about building out systems to meet those demands. And you'll hear from my colleagues about that later in the call. We're going to take two main approaches to doing that. The first is building out the product features that you'll see on our roadmap. The second is refactoring out common patterns, such as reporting or access control into new dedicated services. This will help us build reliable and flexible services. So our new tech stack is JVM based. It includes Kotlin which gives us a smooth ramp from our existing use of Java. We also have some closure. Our new front end is built in Vue.js. We've already made the switch to our new tech stack, and you might have noticed our new login box, which is the first service written in Kotlin and Vue.js and deployed automatically in AWS Cloud. We've also been very busy. Sorry, can you hear my fans? Is that it? Yeah, a little bit of background noise. Yeah. Do I need to speak a bit louder? I, I can't make the fans quieter. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, 
Yeah, so we've also been busy moving our REST API to AWS Cloud and Elasticsearch, and you'll hear more about that later. Automation drives our deployment and release. Some of you may be used to our Tuesday deploys of content system and the traditional ritual suspending of the queue. Our new services, such as MyCrossref, will be continually deployed to the cloud with no interruptions. By using open source tool chains, test coverage, and code quality automation, we can ensure that we build maintainable code bases that remains flexible and stands the test of time. And by having that robust set of automatic test cases, it will allow us to more confidently pay down technical debt as it arises in the future. Next slide. So you'll hear about POSI, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. One of the most relevant principles here is open source. Most new code bases at Crossref have been open source for the last eight or so years, but because most of our content registration, access control, etc., was in the uh, legacy content system code base, improvements to that haven't been open. As we make deeper changes in future, not only into the code, but the assumptions behind the code, we'll continue to do so in more open source repositories. Open also means the ability to extend. We'll be implementing all new functionality as fully documented APIs using Open API and Swagger. And this will make it easier for our community to integrate Crossref functionality into their own services. And as our services will be open source, the community will also be able to run some components themselves for testing or even contribute code back. Setting the, heart, the uh, bar high on test coverage and code quality means we can be more confident about accepting any contributions that our community want to make. That could be language translations, bug fixes, or even new features. Open source also means open issue tracking. You can find our user stories, bug tracking, and tech debt register on our GitLab account. This is an exciting time. Look out for our new services and follow our progress on GitLab. I'd now like to hand over to Joel, our senior site reliability engineer for infrastructure. Thanks, Joe. So right now we're working on a uh, move to the cloud. So we'll go ahead and pop to the next slide here. Just some interesting numbers. Uh, you know, you heard Joe discuss differences between uh, 2000, 2010, and 2020. You can see here the number of records uh, growing exponentially, number of members also growing exponentially, and our API requests. Uh, back in 2000, there was just one dedicated sysadmin staff. Uh, and with our numbers growing exponentially, I'm sure you can imagine this number has grown exponentially as well. So we'll go to the next slide so you can see we've doubled. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and pop onto the next slide. So where do we go from here? And, and how do we grow our staff? Um, the bigger issue is if these things continue to grow exponentially, how do we handle that growth? Because we can't simply add 100 staff uh, to match exponential growth. So we're going to move to the next slide. Uh, this is what comes in with one of our biggest projects right now is the move to the cloud. Your Joe mentioned this a little bit. Uh, one of the biggest reactions to moving to the cloud a lot of businesses have that have been primarily in a data center like Crossref is we're going to lose control. And frankly, uh, in a data center, there's a lot of things we can't control as well. It's still somebody's computer. It's we're just beholden to somebody else being in charge of that computer. So we have a lot of challenges in our data center that are out of our control. So we're, we're not losing too much by moving into the data center. But the bigger thing is, if we're gonna to continue to grow and meet the demand of our API and our data and our members, we need to step up our game and in infrastructure. So we uh, gain a lot of that by letting AWS manage our database servers, worry about backups for us, uh, worry about our cluster health and things like that. We need to offload some of that work so we can continue to work on making things more reliable. Um, there are risks associated, but we are mitigating that by making sure we're not locked in by leveraging things like Docker moving forward. Um, go ahead and introduce uh, Jeffrey, who's a, the uh, CTO here at Crossref. Uh, Hello. Uh, so you've heard from uh, Joe. Was, who's uh, our head of infrastructure, and you've heard from Joel, who's a, a senior uh, site engineer in our infrastructure group. Uh, the technical team at Crossref actually has three groups, and the third group you might not have heard much from recently, but that's about to change. Uh, that third group is uh, R&D, um, and R&D uh, in some form or another has existed at Crossref since uh, I joined Crossref in 2007, and um, the group has been responsible for uh, for launching a bunch of new initiatives that at the moment now seem like they've been part of Crossref for a long time. 
uh, but they include everything from content negotiation to similarity check. Um, at the in the very early days when I first joined Crossref, um, there was a project called Author BOIs, which eventually evolved and turned into a completely separate organization called ORCID. Uh, but there's a whole list of projects that we've um, that have sort of grown out of the R and D groups. Um, uh, initial interactions with the community. Now, recently, the R&D group has been um, dedicated to helping Joe and the developers group um, deal with some of the technical debt issues. So there hasn't been a lot of R in the R&D side of things, but, uh, but that's about to change. And I'm not going to discuss it in detail here because there's a blog post that just went up uh, today, uh, uh, yesterday, actually, uh, that describes some of the changes. But uh, one of the things that you're going to be seeing is an increase in our uh, in our R and D activity. Um, we've uh, the team is already includes uh, uh, two people, two principal engineer uh, developers, uh, uh, Dominique and Esha, and uh, and over the next month or so, uh, Rachel Lemmy is going to be joining the team also uh, as a head of strategic initiatives. Um, and so you're going to see a lot of our uh, a lot of projects starting to ramp up again in the R&D group, and you're going to see us um, developing some new uh, some new capabilities um, and possibly some entire new initiatives. Uh, again, I recommend you go to our blog to look at this um, in detail, and I'll hand back to uh, Rosa. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great update on our move to the cloud in our plans to reinvigorate uh, research and development. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, Joe, and Joel. So next will be Brian, and he will introduce, um, we need a drum roll for this, our all new public roadmap. Over to you, Brian. Thanks, Rosa. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Brian Vickery. I'm director of products at Crossref. Um, as Rosa said, I've got the Pleasure of launching the Crossref Public Roadmap today. Um, I would normally smash a bottle of champagne at this point, but given that I'm actually steering the presentation on this laptop is very, very important. I'm going to uh, give that a miss. Uh, it would also be quite wasteful of good champagne. Um, I know that for many, many people, um, when we get to the roadmap, it will look like there's uh, too much information. Um, I also know that for some others who are very um, detail oriented, there won't necessarily be enough detail there. Um, but the roadmap that we're making public today is a high level information about the things that we're working on, which is quite a lot, I think, as you've already heard, and you'll hear later on in the in the presentations, it covers not just product roadmap, but everything at Crossref. So governance, strategy, community initiatives, uh, as well as the products and services. Um, We've added more than 60 labels to the roadmap, which you can see here. Um, they cover things like overarching themes like my Crossref that Joe referenced, our new user interface, um, uh, Crossref platform, so the underlying technology that drives everything, as well as our strategic goals, um, our products and services, uh, various content types, um, the community, so whether that's uh, publishers of journals, publishers of uh, books, uh, funders, registering grants, uh, the Crossref platform components themselves, um, as well as some internal <clears throat> projects like observability, which is a project to help us understand how our systems are performing and, and how data is processing through it, um, <clears throat> as well as our as well as our teams. Um, so I won't dwell too much on these, but the the labels are there specifically to allow you to filter the board um, when you uh, when you see it. So I also have the <clears throat> enviable task of trying to uh, jump to the next um, slide. One second. I'm going to share with you the roadmap. The link was on your screen. And I hope you can see it now. Is it visible, Jenny? Yes, it is. You can see it. Great, thanks. Um, so as I said, this is this is extremely colourful. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things on it. Um, if you feel that it's, it's in Trello, so most most of you will have used Trello in in the past. Um, just a few uh, helpful hints. Um, if you find the labels to be too noisy, you can click anywhere on the labels, and they should um, contract, so you can see more of the the board itself. Um, just want to orientate you on the uh, on the columns because this is how things will flow through this uh, roadmap. First up, we have um, the research and the planning. Uh, this 
takes a lot of time. It's often um, missed when people are talking about roadmaps and timelines, but research and planning is very, very important where we're discussing things with the community, understanding your needs, discussing things with other infrastructure providers, um, setting out our plans and prioritization. And once those plans are in place, it would move into up next. Um, this is things that we've researched and are committed to doing in, in the near term. Um, and then from there, it will be prioritized and moved into in progress. These are things that we're actively working on right now. Um, and this will be more detail inside those cards. Um, it will move into testing um, when we've completed our um, solution and we'll be either testing it ourselves or we'll be working with um, beta testers in the community to test the solution actually uh, does what you wanted it wanted it to do um, before it moves into adoption. So our, our planning with the community told us that there was a need uh, and now we need to make sure that the solution we've we've provided is, is taken up by the community and, and, and adopted over time. So there's a lot of work that goes on there. And then the final column is uh, self-explanatory. It's recently completed. It's things that we have, um, that we finished um, working on. Just slightly further over the other side of the board, um, on the far right-hand side, you'll see um, other ideas. So these are things that we have um, been discussing uh, at Crossref or been dis discussing um, with, with members of the community, um, members or metadata users. Um, and then to the left of that are, are the other ideas that we have prioritized, which would then move over into research and, and, and planning later on. Um, inside some of the cards, um, you'll see uh, our community forum logo. That means that we are actively seeking community input. Uh, this refers to our new um, UI for content registration that Sarah will talk about um, at the end, at the very end of the uh, call today. Um, she recently posted a blog uh, and uh, we're getting quite a lot of really useful feedback on the community forum. So if you see that logo, I mean, we're always seeking your feedback on everything that we do, but if you see that logo, then there's a specific call for feedback at that time. Um, the only other thing I would say, um, you can, um, if, you hit, if you're on a desktop and you hit the F key, um, you will be able to um, filter the board um, by the labels. That's why um, we've put the labels there. So this particular board now is uh, specifically aligned for similarity check. Uh, you could do the same for event data, for uh, research funders, for grants or anything like that. So um, please do visit uh, the link. I'll just switch back to the presentation. Uh, please do visit the link uh, bit.ly slash crossref dash roadmap and uh, take a look at all of the things that we've got coming up and um, please do provide us your your feedback on the roadmap so this this is the first time we've ever put out a roadmap um, we plan to update it continuously as we're working on on the cards that you can see some of the cards have checklists so you can see our progress as we move forward uh, we hope you find it useful and we uh, look forward to your feedback Over to you, Rosa. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Our first public roadmap. Yeah, this will be really helpful to our community. Thank you very much. Um, so this slide here, uh, just, just wanted to give you a little bit of a reminder of the six goals uh, we will now walk through, uh, just so you know where we are for the next hour or so. And uh, you can also, if you happen to look away from your screen and come back, what we've done is on our slides, we've kind of put the uh, goal that we're talking about on the upper right hand corner of the slide. Okay, so now we're going to touch on our six strategic themes. The first of the six is bolster the team. Now this goal is all about people, support, culture, and resilience, not just because we're coming through a pandemic, but also because we're growing and we need to be able to scale, manage growth more purposefully uh, with appropriate policies, fees, and resources. So um, with that said, I am now going to hand over to Lindsay. Thanks, Rosa. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay. I'm the HR manager at Crossref. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that we were successful with our recruiting efforts and we've added three new hires. Um, Mike Gill and Fabian McCaud joined the tech and product teams and then Arlie Soto became a contractor for the outreach team as well. 
Um, so we also focused on team integration and function. One thing we wanted um, or we worked on was equity practices. So we improved our diversity and inclusion efforts, particularly um, in the area of hiring practices. Um, to do this, we use more job boards and hashtags for underrepresented groups. And we also used um, a one week exclusivity to job boards for underrepresented groups as well. Um, due to the pandemic, we also transitioned all of our staff to remote and we closed the Linfield and Oxford offices. Um, and we also implemented respectful workplace training. Uh, this is something that we had never done before, but we found it was necessary as we continue to have a more dispersed staff across different countries as well as different states within the United States. And going forward uh, for the upcoming quarters, we plan to continue our progress on goal and prior, uh, priority tracking work. Um, next slide, Rosa, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to bring attention to our org chart. The Crossref team is quite small. We have 41 employees total. Uh, so this is also available on the website is any, if anyone's interested in taking a look at it. And I will hand it back to you, Rosa, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Lindsay. Okay, next then is Live Up to Posey. Um, we published a uh, Posey self-assessment earlier this year and like-minded initiatives are, are following suit. Uh, this is a stated goal because we want to be held publicly accountable to the principles of scholarly infrastructure standards of governance, um, insurance and sustainability. So now I'm going to uh, hand over to Jeffrey and Lucy to speak more on that. Thanks, Rosa. Um, I'm Lucy Ofeich. I'm the Director of Finance and Operations at Crossref. Um, and so, as Rosa mentioned, we recently adopted this. The board uh, adopted it at the November 2020 uh, board meeting. And as part of that, we conducted the self-assessment to see how our current operations aligned with the 16 principles that you, there's a link at the bottom here. You can check out. Um, how these principles are, uh, how they're defined. Um, so currently most of our, we've, our current practices align with most of the principles as stated, um, but the principles really are intended to be a guiding framework. So by adopting them, we are committing to working towards these practices. Um, and so for those organizations that have also adopted POSI, you don't necessarily adopt it having met all of them, but that you commit as an organization to working towards them. Um, so over this year, we've identified the ones that we needed to strengthen or improve upon. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about those on the next slides. Um, so this year, as we live up to POSI, um, we've taken on a few areas of focus. So. Just recently at the March board meeting, the board did a review of stakeholder governance. Um, and one of the outcomes of that was that the remit to the nominating committee this year was um, to obviously do a public call for board interest, but also to prioritize uh, recruiting research funders who are Crossref members um, to submit their interest and, and hopefully make it onto the slate for the fall election. Um, that call is underway. Actually, we'll talk about that um, in an upcoming slide. Uh, the other thing we're focusing on is improving our sustainability practices. So we are working towards a 12 month contingency fund, um, which we're getting quite close to. Uh, we also will be publishing more about our operations. We want to be more transparent in um, how we share about our choices and the policies that we have around our operations. Um, and we are, we've recently released a public data file back in January. Um, and we're working, as Joe mentioned, we're working towards making more of our code open. Um, and lastly, we have added the community forum, which is an open public forum that will underpin some of the work that supports doing and, and make that publicly available to members or anyone in the community. 
Um, so I will make a quick plug for the open call, which we have up right now. It's on our blog. Um, we do a public call for interest in the board. All Crossref members are eligible to apply for a board seat. Um, applications are due by June 25th. So if you have not had a look at it, have a look and see if you are interested. Um, and the nominating committee is a committee that is comprised of some of our board members and some of our just standing Crossref members. Um, they review the applications for board seats and put together a slate uh, that will be put forward to the whole Crossref membership to elect the next class of board members. That election will start in the end of September. Um, but take a look, see if you're interested in applying for a seat. And um, the next piece that's also available on our website is um, we will be over the course of the next year publishing more about our finances and operations. Um, we want to be more purposeful in how we make our internal operations transparent. Um, so this is a new page on our site that has some background on our financials. We'll keep it up to date. We've added just a few recent years of our annual filings. Um, and then over as the year goes on, we're planning to publish more about our employment practices our and our hiring and recruitment practices. So that's all publicly available, reusable, um, and transparent. And um, I'll pass it back to Rosa. Thank you, Lucy, for that update on our commitment to POSI, as well as our uh, efforts to be transparent with our operations. Um, so our next goal is engage communities. This goal centers on growth, strengthening relationships, community facilitation, and content. So Jeffy referred earlier to growing scale um, uh, of Crossref uh, over, with over 14,000 members and soon to hit 15,000. And we're managing this growth uh, is key. It's a key theme for us this coming year. In addition, uh, working with growing number of sponsors, helping us lower barriers to participation around the world, including supporting languages other than English. Um, and expanding the support we offer for research funders um, and institutions are also a priority. So I'm going to now hand over to Vanessa and Rachel and um, from our community engagement team to cover two key initiatives um, that uh, have some recent updates. So over to you all. Okay, hi, um, so I'm Vanessa, I'm community engagement manager at Crossref. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the community forum, which Brian and Lucy have already touched upon briefly. So after undertaking some research, including sending a survey to quite a large cross section of our membership and doing some beast testing of the platform, in February of this year, we officially launched our community forum. So the forum is hosted on open source discussion platform Discourse, and you can find it at community.crossref.org. The goal of the forum is to create an open, inclusive space where Crossref members, ambassadors, sponsors, service providers, and, and really anyone can come together, have discussions, share experiences and expertise, and hopefully truly connect with one another. The forum enables us to provide a more open and collaborative form of problem solving. So it allows people to truly engage across different time zones and languages. They can post questions to be answered by Crossref staff, ambassadors, or other members of the forum. They can also join discussion threads, volunteer for working groups, beta testing projects, help to co-create materials, provide feedback on new developments, and find out about upcoming events and webinars. An example of this is a recent call for help with creating um, some multilingual welcome emails resulted in the welcome email being translated into 13 different languages, including Russian, Portuguese, French, Indonesian, Chinese, among others. And we do currently have a call for feedback about our content registration tool, which has seen lots of discussion and suggestions from the community. So building a community is not an overnight task. It does take time and effort. However, we are seeing a steady and slowly increasing usage of our forum. And hopefully this will continue as we continue um, to further integrate the forum into our plans and our activities and our communications. So we hope to see you there. And I'm now gonna hand over to Rachel. 
Cool. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to talk quickly about um, about funder engagement. Um, so we talk a lot about metadata, identifiers, etc. at Crossref. And those are nothing really without the, the community that, um, that works with them. So we've been working with funders to support the registration of grants with Crossref over the past couple of years. Um, the thinking is that really open grant metadata and identifiers being integrated through publication workflows and connected with outputs will help better connect them to the, to the scholarly record. So that's being able to, um, to link grants to, um, to published outputs and things like data and preprints, stands to report to improve the reporting on those outputs. But I think a real kind of key goal is just streamlining that process to free researchers and um, funders, um, research managers up, um, to, to do other things and, um, and to be able to better support that research. We work with a funder advisory group. Um, so we're seeing um, funders from that group and, and more widely join Crossref to register grants with us. I think over, just over 17,000 so far. And that's from Welcome in the UK to ARDC um, right over in Australia via the United States, France, Ireland and more. Um, and we're also working on a funder perceptions project to explore how we can better support um, funder needs. And that engagement is already um, informing our approach to simple, responsive content registration user interfaces. Um, we work closely with, um, with the folks at Datasite and ORCID. Um, so it's complementary to the work that they're doing to link researchers and contributors and outputs. And we're looking forward to seeing continued growth in this important area. Um, so I think we're, we're on to our next section. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, both of you, for our update on our community forum and, and where we are with uh, funder engagement. So the next strategic theme is uh, improved metadata. This goal involves researching and communicating the value of richer, connected, and reusable open metadata and incentivizing people to meet best practices while also making it possible and easier to do so. So um, to talk more about this, I'm going to hand over to Patricia Beeney, Head of Metadata, and again to Ginny and Rachel. Thanks. Over to you all. Hi, thank you, Rosa. Um, before we talk about the Crossref role in uh, Richer Metadata, I wanted to um, give a mention of Metadata 2020, which was an initiative we were involved in setting up a few years ago. And over two to three years, we conducted a lot of working groups to um, help different players responsible for metadata curation, sharing um, and consuming to uh, understand each other and, and figure out how we can all improve. Um, recently, it has repositioned as an advocacy campaign, which builds on the outputs of those working groups. And it's also tying metadata quality to the United Nations sustainability goals. So um, with richer, connected and reusable open metadata, ending poverty and zero hunger might be more achievable. Uh, so there's a lot of information to find uh, more about this on the metadata2020.org website. And you can also sign the pledge there to uh, add your promise to do your bit for richer, reusable, open metadata. Uh, so now on to Crossref's role in this, and Patricia is our head of metadata strategy, and she's going to cover that now. Uh, thanks. Um, so I, I know a lot of you are aware that for a while we were collecting a lot of input on what changes we want to make in our schema and we put all of the changes out for comment um, at the kind of the end of last year, but um, we've been doing a lot of work internally uh, to get ourselves set up to be able to make these changes successfully. So I'm happy to say that we are verging on being able to release um, one of the, the first major changes that is support for the ROAR identifier in our metadata. Um, and we hope to be um, engaging some of our members um, to test submissions for us soon. I know we've got a few members kind of waiting in the wings 
to work with us to get this going. Um, we're, we'll also be accepting ISNI and Wikidata identifiers in our metadata um, and adding these identifiers to our affiliation met metadata in particular will be very useful. Um, so we hope you're as excited as we are and look for more information on that soon. Um, we're also having discussions on how best to distribute these identifiers in our outputs and hope we're hoping long term to be able to match ISNI and Wikidata identifiers to Roar and um, make it really easy for you all to uh, um, interrogate our affiliation metadata. All right, next slide. So after that, we've got a lot of other exciting uh, work to do. Um, next step, we're going to allow support for credit in our metadata schema. This will all allow uh, members to send us roles tagged with the credit taxonomy. And we're also accepting multiple roles in our contributor metadata. Right now we only accept one and that doesn't really reflect the type of work that contributors put into the, the works that you're registering with us. Um, we'll also be adding support for an expanded set of contributor identifiers. Um, we have supported ORCID for a while and it's great, but we feel like we also need to support contributors who aren't able to have an ORCID um, record. And we're also expanding support for citations that will hopefully move identifying data and software citations forward, make it easier for um, those using our metadata to um, identify a data citation as a data citation. Um, this includes allowing members to supply types for citations. They can also um, supply some identifiers that can be used downstream um, within reference lists. All right, next slide. Um, and finally, I know a lot of you is, um, are excited about this. Um, we're working with a contractor to complete a compl to create a complete JATS to Crossref transformation script that will hopefully be of use to many members. Um, this is intended to be comprehensive, support all of the metadata we collect, um, accommodate several flavors of JATS, um, and Part of that plan will be a way to submit that automatically. Right now, I know that those of you who, who use our JATS conversion aren't able to send us complete metadata and you have to upload your files one by one and no one really wants to spend their time doing that. Um, but the new transformation will include abstracts, relationships, updates, um, and things like roaring credit. Um, we're also working on a lot of documentation for our metadata in general, but also specifically how our metadata maps to JATS. Um, that will make it easier for you who don't want to send, send us JATS directly to um, just really know how to tag your JATS to work best with uh, Crossref. Um, we'll be um, following a lot of the JATS for our recommendations uh, to make that work. Um, and we also have some kind of long-term plans to accept JATS as a native format, but that's still very much in the planning stage. Um, but for now, I can say that we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to support this uh, JATS transformation sooner rather than later. All right, next um, will be Rachel. Cool. Um, thanks, Patricia. Um, so you can see that we're, we're we're coming at the idea of improving our metadata from from a number of angles, and, and really key to that is the um, is the work that Patricia um, is doing, and the um, yeah, and the um, and the initiatives we we support in that way. Um, so lots of, of exciting things coming there. Um, this is um, the idea of community source corrections is certainly one that's been um, bubbling along for a while at Crossref and it's really been um, catalyzed recently by some community discussions and around things like the, the population and dissemination of retraction metadata. Um, so you might have come to Crossref um, to use our metadata. It's a major source of information to third parties like citation management services, scholarly sharing networks. Um, but if you've ever tried to update Crossref metadata or if you've sent in um, an update to, or uh, emailed us about a correction to the metadata, 
you know that that procedure is, it's a bit hard to find and it's a bit opaque. So we collect reports of metadata issues and forward them to the publisher. And we know that it's more difficult than we'd like it to be for members to, to just make those updates to the metadata. So we wanted to explore ways to, to crowdsource metadata corrections from a range of sources and to feed those back in in a way that's visible, but makes it easy for, um, for members to accept or reject these so that everyone can benefit from um, more accurate information. With the, the real caveats that this is really exploratory um, at this point, so the, the will be in touch, I think, is the key message of on this, um, we're going to we're going to be exploring it um, and digging it into it in a bit more detail over the next couple of months. Um, so we will be in touch, and we'd appreciate your um, your feedback. I think it's back to you, Rosa. Yes, excellent. Thank you. A lot of work being done around improving metadata. So um, great stuff. Thank you all for that. Uh, next strategic theme uh, we have is uh, collaborate and partner. We've always collaborated, but we want to work even more closely with like-minded organizations to uh, solve problems together. Uh, uh, perhaps in the future, we could also partner with others to find uh, operating efficiencies uh, for our overlapping stakeholders. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, hand back uh, to Rachel. Over to you, Rachel. Lovely. Thank you. So um, the other initiative that, um, that um, a real sort of key project that Crossref is supporting is ROAR or the Research Organization Registry. Um, you've heard a bit, um, you've heard already about the ways that we're really keen to be supporting ROAR soon, um, especially in the section about metadata. I guess just to, um, to, to fill everyone in, ROAR itself um, has been really busy. Um, Liz Kersnarich has joined as an adoption lead. Um, Roar's also supporting additional metadata um, based on grid um, in the Roar API and data dump. There's curation workflow, um, which is progressing well, both on the, the, te the technical and the community side. Um, obviously key to um, is being able to, to update the, the registry as, um, as organizations evolve. Um, Building out that workflow is important and also supporting new working groups um, around the API, for example, and about adoption, which I think is really key um, now that data site supports it and organizations like ORCID are also building it in. Obviously, um, we're a big part of that. So being able to collect ROAR IDs, disseminate them via our APIs, and support ROAR across other tools like participation reports are all going to aid adoption. So we're going to play a big part in that. And we're going to take some time towards the end of September to run a joint webinar with ROAR to really kind of dig into that stuff and provide sort of practical guidance um, for, for our members in terms of how to use that information. So um, we'll post more details on that um, before the end of this month so that you can sign up if that's something that you're interested in joining. And we really hope you will be. Um, Susan, I'll give you the floor. Great, thanks Rachel. Um, my name is Susan Collins and I am a Community Engagement Manager here at Crossref. Um, and I work closely with our colleagues at the Public Knowledge Project and wanted to give an update on our shared work. So PKP and CrossF have been collaborating now for several years uh, to make it easier for our many members who use the OJS publishing platform to access and implement CrossF services. Um, and this has included both the development of CrossF related plugins for OJS, including the content registration plugin, reference linking um, and reference deposits, um, and depositing funding information. And PKP is also part of our um, growing sponsor program. In 2019, we began regular working group calls with PKP, um, and in 2020, PKP and CrossF signed an MOU to formalize um, this partnership. Um, included in the MOU is a statement of work for continued development of CrossRef OJS integrations and the improvement to the existing plugins, um, and also in enhanced documentation. So development work began late last year, and so far, a cited by plugin, a plugin for our cited by service has been developed and we're working with PKP on the documentation for implementation on that. Um, a pl plugin for our Crossmark service is planned. We don't have an exact time frame for it, but most likely quarter four of this year. 
PKP has also started development on their OGS 3.4 release, which is due later this year, Q3 or Q4. Um, and this new version will include uh, consolidation of all cross reference related plugins into one place, improved DOI management and interface for articles and issues, and consolidation of DOI management onto one screen, thus making it a little easier to identify where DOIs are missing and providing tools to generate and deposit DOIs in bulk. And so we're excited about this work because it's going to provide a better workflow for the many members we have who use OJS um, and also the ability to manage all of the journal's DOIs in one place, easier access to the crosshair related plugins and um, the management and implementation of selected services. And you can read uh, more about all of the upcoming features of version 3.4 in the link on the slide. Um, I'll turn it back over to you now, Ginny, um, to talk about our collaboration with DOAJ. Thank you. Yes. So um, DOAJ is the directory of open access journals, and we have been working with them pretty closely the last um, several years as well. And more recently, uh, so recently that we haven't even announced it yet until now, uh, this week we signed uh, a memorandum of understanding with, with them, with DOAJ. Um, there's lots of overlap uh, between our organizations in our membership small and emerging publishers, but also lots of gaps on both sides. So we um, signed this MOU so that we can work more closely together on sharing data and information. And we're going to be doing some analysis and outreach to identify countries and communities that need more support. And our goal is to lower barriers from uh, barriers around the world. And this quote from Lars, the DOAJ founder and MD is really good. Together we stand a greater chance of encouraging an open, fair and fully inclusive future for scholarly publishing. So that's a bit of news uh, hot off the press. And uh, Brian is now gonna talk about a much more established uh, relationship with an update on ORCID. Yeah, thanks Ginny. Um, so this uh, ORCID auto update is a classic example of infrastructure at work. Um, registering and sharing metadata and persistent identifiers such as ORCID IDs and, and, and DOIs means systems can communicate with each other to save everyone a lot of time and effort. So um, when members register their content with Crossref, we encourage the inclusion of ORCID IDs, so unique codes that identify individuals who contributed to that publication. And when an, I, when, a, when an ORCID ID is included in the metadata provided to Crossref, along with other information, such as the title of the work, uh, the DOI, we can automatically update the author's um, ORCID record uh, as soon as we receive that, that metadata, provided we've, been, um, provided we've been given permission to do so. Um, I love this tweet uh, by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Gad uh, from a couple of uh, months ago. Um, they posted a preprint to SOC Archive and um, SOC Archive had um, registered the DOI and the metadata with Crossref and Crossref had updated the ORCID profile. And uh, that all happened within 35 minutes. And that's, uh, you know, that's the magic happening, if you like. The author didn't need to go to ORCID profile and, uh, and add that work. It would all just happen behind the scenes. Um, we've had a lot of success with ORCID auto update. Um, so far, we've pushed more than 6 million um, works to ORCID profiles. Um, all, we, we request permission. So the first time we see an ORCID ID in our metadata, we send a request to the um, author's ORCID inbox and request permission to be able to update their profile on their behalf. Um, all time, around 50% of authors have granted us that permission. Um, not that many have denied us permission. Uh, there are a lot don't respond. And I think that's sometimes because uh, they, don't, they haven't set up um, email notifications from the um, ORCID profile platform to theirs. But in recent times, uh, so the last quarter of last year, um, after we'd made some text changes to our um, invitation emails, those those numbers have really gone up. So it's it's approaching 60% of authors granting us permission now. Um, if you look at the table towards the bottom, you can really see the growth of this year on year. So the first column is um, quarter one 2020, and the second column is quarter one 2021. So uh, in the in the previous quarter, uh, January to March this year, we pushed nearly three quarters of a million works to ORCID profiles. Um, and I said, over the whole time this um, tool has been operating, we've pushed six million 
works, but we pushed 2.7 million in the last 12 months. So this is really, really escalating as our members start to register more and more um, ORCID IDs with us. Um, we had a summit meeting with um, colleagues from ORCID and data sites uh, in April to talk about ways that we can continue to improve this, um, to improve the service, to um, you know, make it e even easier for more and more authors. Um, I did a back of the envelope calculation. Um, if uh, I'm assuming it takes about five minutes to go to ORCID and to um, upload your, your work manually. Um, then for the 2.7 million um, items we pushed successfully last year, that equates to 225,000 hours <laughs> saved uh, for, for, for the research community. And if we take an estimate of um, near 2,000 hours that we all sadly have to work every year, um, that equates to over 120 um, full-time researchers time saved, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, that is back of the envelope calculations. Um, I'm sure some people work a lot longer than a lot, lot longer than that and take shorter time to update to to ORCID. But that's that's a lot of value for the for the research community based on a on a tool like this. Um, so yeah, more to come. Um, hopefully, we'll have some improvements on the ORCID auto update um, tool um, to be announced later on in the year. So I'm going to hand back to Rosa. Really informative. Thank you all so much. Lots happening. Good news, big news. Um, so the next goal is simplify uh, services. So uh, this goal is all about focus, um, about uh, delivering easy to use tools that are critically important uh, for our community. And lots of work is happening in the background, um, behind the scenes, and we've been strengthening uh, and continuing to strengthen uh, our code base uh, while opening up all of the code uh, in order to unblock uh, some of the initiatives that we know people have been waiting for. So with that said, I am going to hand it over to Sarah and Carlos. Thanks, Rosa. Uh, my name is Sarah Bowman. I am a product manager here at Crossref. Uh, I'm going to tell you about one of the hopefully invisible behind the scene pro scenes projects we've been working on, which is improving authentication to Crossref tools and services. So just this past April, we rolled out what we're calling Authenticator, which is our new tool for logging in, authenticating with Crossref services. And ideally, most of you didn't even notice that we did this, um, aside from a new interface on your login screen. One of our top priorities in this project was to allow our existing members to continue to use their current processes and logins and passwords. And we didn't want our members to need to make immediate changes in order to continue using our tools and services. So for our existing members, you have continued using our shared role credentials. So your organization has one login and one password and you share that among your team. For our new members who have joined since April, you have been given user credentials, which are email-based and that is um, every individual at your organization has their own email login and password, and they manage that all on their own. This has given us a more flexible, simple, and secure authentication system. Um, it's more flexible in that, you know, if one member of your organization forgets their password, they can reset that on their own under our shared credentials model. Um, you'd have to give the new password to every member at your organization. Uh, it's made our authentication more simple, especially if you are a service provider or you work with multiple Crossref members, you were juggling multiple logins and multiple passwords. Under our new authentication model, your user credential can be affiliated with multiple Crossref members. Uh, so you can um, put in your email address and your password and then choose which member you want to log in as. This is also making our authentication more secure. If you're working with vendors or third parties, uh, they have their own credentials. If you stop working with them, you can have their permissions revoked. Likewise, if someone leaves your organization, you don't need to reset the organization-wide password. You um, can just revoke that um, individual's permissions. So this is um, helping us improve our technology. 
we're paying down some of that technical debt and it's allowing us to move toward um, a more modular and flexible architecture. And we are rolling this out slowly, um, deliberate phased approach to our membership. Currently new standalone members, that is members that are not sponsored members or sponsoring organizations are being set up with user credentials. Existing members um, can continue using their shared credentials and sponsored members are also using their shared role credentials. We recognize that there are some additional features we need to roll out to them before we can um, roll this out to the rest of our membership. And so the next phase of the authentication project that we'll work on is working toward a role-based access management system. And this diagram uh, is a really simplistic view of what a role-based access management um, framework would look like. A user is assigned to a role and the role comes with certain permissions or privileges. So you might have an admin, a user assigned to an admin role who can manage the other users at your organization and also deposit and retrieve metadata. You might have another role for just depositing metadata and retrieving metadata, and then a read role that would just be able to retrieve metadata. Um, this isn't necessarily what ours will look like, but uh, it's just a, a simple example to help you wrap your brain around what I'm talking about. Um, our technology team is now working on exploring some of the industry standard open source access management frameworks so that we could have out of the box role-based access management um, without having to build that from the ground up. But what we need to do um, in conjunction with that exploration is um, adapt and improve our community data model. And that's the data model that describes who are members, users, prefixes, sponsored organizations, sponsored members, what are all, all of those enti entities and how do they interact with each other? Our, our membership has grown and changed rapidly and we need to adapt our data model to match those changes because that underpins uh, how all of our users interact with our services. So that will be our, our next task. Um, and with that, I will hand off to Patrick. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, I'm Patrick, and I help manage the Crossref REST API. And I want to share with you what we've been working on for a while now, expanding on a few of the things mentioned earlier by Joe and Joel. Um, so we get a lot of traffic to the API, hovering around 300 million requests per month, plus or minus 100 million. Um, but scaling to meet demand and extending the API to cover new use cases have been challenging with the existing application and infrastructure. Um, some service issues have been easier to diagnose and fix than others, but we've been limited in the options available to maintain acceptable service levels. To address these issues and a few others, we've been working on effectively two migrations at once, um, switching out the search engine behind the REST API from Solar to Elasticsearch, and from hosting the application on dedicated hardware in a data center to uh, a cloud platform um, like Joel was talking about. And so while working on these migrations, we've aimed to maintain uh, feature parity, avoid introducing breaking changes, and keep service disruptions to a minimum. But uh, even maintaining the status quo from an end user perspective still takes a lot of work, not to mention constantly juggling uh, competing priorities. Um, admittedly, this project has been going on for a very long time. Um, and uh, during the whole project, we needed to keep the application stable in order to have any chance of success. So we've had to say no to non-critical bug fixes and new feature requests until the migration is complete. Um, if you've written into us, um, you've probably gotten a response talking about how the REST API is in code freeze, um, and hopefully we'll be lifting that very soon. Um, and so even while we've worked on these migrations, we've still had to carve out some time to troubleshoot problems with the existing API. And uh, to do that, we deprecated some features that were causing problems, so long as we had viable alternatives for our users. Um, we reallocated hardware from the public pool to the polite pool to improve stability. And we're constantly working to identify and temporarily block problematic clients. Um, so if you haven't seen the two bits of documentation linked here, um, the etiquette section of the main documentation and the newer API tips document, uh, be sure to check them out. So we're almost ready to begin cutting over to the Elasticsearch backed API hosted um, in AWS. 
Uh, we've achieved feature parity earlier this year. We're um, currently conducting performance and load testing with existing traffic mirrored to the new infrastructure so that we can fine tune it. Um, we're testing the new service internally and we'll soon be testing um, with partners and the public. And we're planning to um, perform a pool by pool cutover um, with the ability to roll back if anything goes sideways. Um, so keep an eye on the Crossref blog and social media channels for a more detailed announcement in the coming weeks, including directions on um, how you can help us test it out before we cut over. Um, so after a perfect cutover with no problems or hiccups whatsoever, we hope to keep up a steady cadence of improvements and other fixes, um, starting with support for retrieving grants metadata via the REST API. Um, over the last few months, we pulled together the specification for grant support and we're already making good progress on implementation. Then we'll keep working through our prioritized backlog, which you can find via the new Crossref roadmap. Um, we plan to focus on the highest priority bugs and other um, kind of data discrepancies after support for grants has been um, delivered. So I wanted to thank all of the Crossref staff who've been working on this project for a long time. And also wanted to thank our API user community for your support and patience. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Martin to talk about event data. Yeah, hello. Um, so yeah, I'm Martin Rickman. I'm a, a product manager here at Crossref as well. Um, in case you're not um, familiar with um, with event data, uh, there's a um, we we collect uh, mentions of Crossref DOIs and the related research that are made around the internet in various different places. So on in the corner of the slide here, there's a, a screenshot of a Wikipedia reference section. Uh, and a number of those references have DOIs in them um, or links to publisher websites. And we collect those and make them available in a public API. Um, we collected nearly 740 million events since we started and, and we're up to around 20 million new events per month, which is considerably more than, than when we started. Um, we, we have 12 sources that we collect um, a, a wide range of different types of data from. So, we work closely with DataSite um, to work out where, where data sets are cited by research articles and where research articles cite data sets. Uh, we, uh, Wikipedia, I've, I've mentioned, um, social media blogs and, and other kinds of, of sources. I, I wrote a blog post recently about a plan of action for event data. Um, I can put a link in the, in the chat. Um, uh, but the kind of summary is, is that you know, event data has a lot of interest. It has a lot of potential around it. I think we're still reaching the potential that event data has. There's some um, more work to do there. Um, uh, and the, the server infrastructure that we had, we, we haven't really changed since we've launched event data. So we need to do some work uh, to improve the stability and, and make sure that we can keep up with the growth that we've, we've seen. So we're focusing on three areas. One is um, stability to make sure that uh, you know, we're getting events in in a reasonable amount of time and getting them out to organizations that are interested in um, using event data. Um, we want to consolidate the sources and, uh, of events that we have already, um, have a little bit more visibility and, uh, and checks into um, some of the, the things that are going on in event data. Um, and at the same time, you know, we don't want to stand still. We want to build a future roadmap for event data um, to look at uh, what future sources might might be in uh, in event data. Um, we started uh, work on this and there's a few things that we've done already. Um, we've improved, we've made a few tweaks to the API, which has improved the uptime and, and stability. We had well above 99% uptime um, last year, uh, last month, which was really nice to see. Um, we keep a list of the um, uh, publisher domains or mem domains where we know that API uh, DOI works um, of course, of works with a DOI are mentioned um, because when you know if someone mentions a, a DOI on, online, normally they will use the publisher website um, URL and not necessarily a DOI. Although we'd love everyone to use DOIs, so we do a kind of translation from the um, the URL um, to the DOI, uh, and we added about six thousand more mappings earlier this year, and that hadn't been updated for a while. Um, and we found some improvements to several sources, including bringing in uh, relationship data, um, from which is, is recorded alongside uh, Crossref 
uh, metadata records. Um, so we're gradually fixing things. You can see what we're doing um, in the next six months or so on the public roadmap that's already been mentioned. And the priorities up until the end of the year uh, will be to do more work on the infrastructure. We've got quite a lot to do. We're still uh, kind of planning some of that. It's coming after the, the REST API um, work. Um, there's some overlap there in, in terms of the expertise that we, that we call on. Um, uh, we're looking at the use case of um, data citation. As I said earlier, we work very closely with um, data site. Uh, we also work with STM on, on this. And we have a bit more work to do there. Um, and then we'll be looking into where we could um, uh, improve event data, add new sources potentially, assess the usefulness of the sources that we already have. And later this year, we will be doing some consultation with members um, about you know, which, which potential new sources would be the most interesting um, to them. Um, so with that, I can pass on to Fabienne to talk about similarity check. Hello. Hello, I'm Fabian, the product manager for Similarity Check. Um, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Similarity Check, it's a content comparison tool to detect potential cases of plagiarism. It's powered by Authenticate, produced by Turnitin, and it's available exclusively to Crossref members. It allows similar, similarity check users to compare documents against internet sources, as well as against around 78 million full text documents contributed by Crossref members. Similarity check is seeing a healthy user growth, plus 167 members compared to last year, and an increase in the number of documents checked. Next slide, please. Um, we know that similarity check users have been uh, waiting a long time for a new version of Authenticate, and you'll be very happy to hear that we're now very close to releasing it. There are a number of new features. It has a cleaner and more engaging interface, a new content portal to allow users to check their index content and fix indexing errors, a simplified view of matches, new citations and preprint sources exclusion filters, an increased document upload capacity, a Google Drive document upload functionality, and a brand new annotation feature currently only available in private mode only. Next slide, please. So this is a preview of what the new similarity report will look like. The layout is similar to version one. The manuscript is on the left-hand side, the match is on the right-hand side, but it has a much fresher, cleaner interface. It also provides the overall similarity score at the top of the report and the red flag signals the use of hidden text or suspicious characters. Next slide, please. So we'll be releasing the new version of Authenticate in stages, first to native users. So that's to say users who are logging in directly via the Authenticate website. From the end of quarter two, new similarity check members will automatically have access to the new version of Authenticate. And we will start migrating existing members from version two, one to version two in the second part of the year. We're currently working with peer review system providers to prepare for the migration of similarity check accessing, sorry, of similarity check users accessing Authenticate via manuscript tracking system platform or MTS. E-Journal Press and Editorial Manager of version two on their roadmap already for this year, and we're hoping others will soon follow suit. From quarter three, we will be working with members who integrate directly through their own system via an API, and we'll be supporting them with their V2 integration. In phase two, uh, we are planning to release new or enhanced features and give similarity check users the ability to save and share reports with authors, make public and private annotations, manage parent-child accounts to give Crossref sponsor members an overview of the organizations they sponsor, and investigate the detection of um, image manipulation. So some very exciting developments ahead. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Sarah and Patrick, um, who are going to talk about content registration. Thanks, Fabian. Um, We've recently started a, a project to explore the content registration UI uh, for 
our members to register content. Uh, the bulk of the content that is re registered with us now is done so programmatically. So members machines talking to our machines, uh, but plenty of our members don't have the technical expertise to build XML and then send it to us this way. So for those members, we provide helper tools. Examples of these are metadata manager, web deposit form, simple text query, the others I'm forgetting. Um, each helper tool has its own use cases, but also its own limitations. And what we've heard from our members is it's leading to a confusing and inconsistent experience. So our goal here is to create a unified experience for our members. We've begun prototyping a new content registration UI user interface to eventually replace Metadata Manager in the web deposit form. And our strategy for this new tool is heavily influenced by the lessons that we've learned from our existing tools, Metadata Manager and web deposit mainly. Uh, for this new tool, we want to have a strong community focus, and we're designing this for our smaller members. Our target audience is really those smaller members that lack the technical expertise or the staff to create XML, uh, and our help work tool should lower that barrier for members to fully participate in Crossref. We're also focused on accessibility and localization, supporting major international accessibility guidelines and allowing this tool to be translated into local languages to meet our growing and global membership. And we'll be open sourcing uh, everything that we do, building in the open so that others can contribute across um, a variety of different ways, be that um, contributing to the UI or contributing to translations um, for localization. We also are taking a, a user-centered approach to design, building a unified UI to simplify our tools so that our members have just one place to go to register content and focusing on a technical solution that allows for rapid iteration. This is a, something that we see is holding us back in our, our current tools. It takes too long to support new content types and schema updates. Um, and so we're, we're focusing on a technical solution that allows for us to rapidly iterate on those and building the right tools for the right users. If the core users of our helper tools are our smaller members, we need to tailor the feature set to solve the problems that those members are facing. And then finally, building content for the future, um, taking a tactical approach to what content types we support because we can't support all content types right off the bat. So we'll quickly build UIs in a strategic order, um, identify and build in the areas of the highest impact and lowest effort first. Uh, and then kind of that same approach to which fields we're supporting. Not all of our members will need, will supply member metadata for all fields in our schema. So we need to identify and support the most used and the most useful first. And then we can add more in future iterations if well, the feedback we get uh, indicates that we're missing a need. Um, and kind of as a, a broader part of this, um, we've also working on redesigning simple text query to be a more powerful tool. Um, and we'll rename this match references to, to match um, what the tool is, is providing for our members. So we would love to hear from you. It's been said over and over again on this call, uh, but we've got a topic in the community forum. It's under the questions from Crossref section and it's called feedback on the new helper tool. We've had a very lively um, discussion going there. And it's really great to hear from the community what is most important for us to support, what um, you really liked about our current uh, helper tools, and maybe what's lacking, um, what would really help you the most. Um, so I invite you to join us over there. And with that, I will turn it back over to Rosa. Thank you very much. It's great presentations. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, great stuff. Well done. So I'm going to take a quick look at our Q&A before we wrap up and see if we have any outstanding questions here. Anyone from Crossref wants to highlight something, let me know. I think we had about 10 questions. They've all been answered by mainly Isaac. 
So there's a couple of questions about ORCID auto update. Um, the Crossref member needs to include the ORCID IDs in their metadata deposits with Crossref, um, ideally authenticated ORCID IDs. And the researcher can once only choose to allow Crossref to um, fill their record with works. So that works for all their publishers. Uh, and there were a couple of questions as well about metadata um, uh, feedback and we had uh, a practitioner's interest group, um, a metadata interest group that Patricia was running, um, which she can say a bit more about her plans for, but also answered that um, we got so much feedback, we now need to work on it and implement it. So um, we're kind of <laughs> in that mode, but we do plan to keep keep that um, line of communication open and probably with more focused task forces. Um, we just set up a preprints advisory group, for example, which uh, we didn't mention on this call, but uh, is just getting started uh, to, to fine tune that metadata schema. And I think all the other questions so far, unless there's any coming in now, I see one more. Uh, what about Scolix? Yeah, so we are a supporter of, of Scolix. Um, I'm not sure, I think, did we cover data citation and that work earlier? I'm gonna ask uh, Martin if he's still on. I know he has a thunderstorm where he is in Germany, but yes, do you wanna talk you. to Scolix, Martin? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, we, we do, we work um, closely with, with Scolix and we support a Scolix endpoint for, um, for event data as well. So any data citations that come into event data are available um, in Scolix format. Um, uh, and I, I know that other organizations that provide a Scolix endpoint, uh, like Scolix Explorer, for example, use um, data from um, Crossref event data. They also pull in data from, from data site uh, independently as well. Um, yeah, so we're, yeah, we're very involved with Scolix. Excellent, thank you, thank you. All right, so um, next slide. I think that's all it for questions, I think so. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, great, yes. Yeah. So um, we just wanted to share some key links for further reading, further, further reading, sorry. <laughs> These sources um, will give more detail on everything that we've talked about today. Um, and we will add these links to the chat now for you, so you can uh, check those out. Next slide. And before you go, I uh, just wanted to share some ways uh, in which we can keep in touch. I'll follow up in the next few days or so with uh, the recording and the slides. And um, thank you all so much for coming. Be well. Bye for now. Thanks, everybody. You get seven minutes back. We do. <laughs> thank you.